Uh, this is going to be the first of a semester of online events that we're hosting here at the Centre for International Film Research at the University of Southampton. Uh, my name is Dr Louis Bayman and I'm a lecturer in the Department of Film Studies and I'll be chairing the session today. I'd also like to thank Tracy Story and Kevin Donnelly for their share in organising the speaking series. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of our attendees from the staff, student and wider research community at Southampton, as well as to all of those from beyond the university who are joining us today. If you have a drink, I hope it's from a plastic cup and with a shared bowl of kettle chips by your side to give that authentic university seminar feel. So it's my great pleasure to be able to start this series by welcoming Professor Vincennes Hedegaard. Um, we're giving a great vote of thanks to Professor Hedegaard and normally our research speakers would benefit from the chance to meet our students uh, as well as from the warmest hospitality that Southampton has to offer. Uh, but Professor Hedegaard is elected to give us his time without so much as a drink in the brew house's recompense. So thanks very much for that. Uh, Vincennes Hedegaard is the Professor of Cinema Studies at the Goethe University Frankfurt and the Director of the Graduate and Colleague Configurations of Film. As well as being a distinguished professor in the field, he's also an active member of the wider film studies research community. He's a co-founder of NEXT, the European Network for Cinema and Media Studies, and the founding editor of the Zeitschrift for Medienwissenschaft. You may notice that German isn't one of my specialities, so apologies there, but that's the Journal for Me Media Studies. He's a pr principal investigator of the research center Normative Orders at Goethe University, and a member of the Academy of Sciences and Literature Mainz. His research concerns the aesthetics of film within the larger framework of a history of risk and uncertainty in modernity. Now, we wanted to invite Professor Hedegaard not only for the glimpse that he's about to offer into his current research, but also because of the approach to the study of film, both empirical and theoretical, that he's developed throughout his career. Professor Hedegaard has published extensively in English and in German on subjects as varied as Alfred Hitchcock, Rambo series, Charlotte Rampling and Sergei Eisenstein. But it's perhaps his ability to look at forms of cinema that many might consider marginal or perhaps not even cinema at all. So it's then to reflect back upon the nature of cinema as a whole. And this forms one of the distinguishing features of his intellectual endeavours as a whole. His very many published essays include studies of trailers, of fandom or corporate cinema, and these become disquisitions onto questions such as narrative, the gaze and the individuality or otherwise of cinematic style. In his 2014 book, The Miracle of Realism, Andre Bazan and the Cosmology of Reality, co-authored with Patrick Vondero, he managed not only to find something new to say about realism, but did so by making an attentive return to the source writings of the foundational realist theorist, Andre Bazan, thereby rediscovering the importance of Catholicism to his very definition of reality. Hedegaard's edited collections include films that work, Industrial Film and the Productivity of Media from 2009, Preserving and Exhibiting Media Art from 2013, and The State of Post Cinema, Tracing the Moving Image in the Age of Digital Dissemination from 2016. And these show a similar desire to cohere an intellectual community around either neglected or borderline forms of cinema through which the medium as a whole can be addressed and to speculate about cinema's future through careful historical rediscoveries of its past. So we welcome him very, very warmly here in what promises to be a new and innovative chapter in this intellectual trajectory as he talks to us on the topic of film and as data, a note on behavioural science and the moving image. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, you're on, uh, you're on mute. I should be on now. That's absolutely great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, um, uh, Louis, for the invitation and for this overly generous introduction. Um, I actually, uh, right now, I am looking at a split screen and the right half of that shows me uh, a, a, a medium close shot of Scott Curtis, um, <laughs> who seems to be joining us from Doha in Qatar. Uh, 
um, which is a, a great honor, but also puts a lot of pressure on me because Scott Curtis is someone who is much more qualified to talk about um, the issues that I'm going to address today uh, than I am, in fact, and um, I hope we are, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a dialogue. Scott will also know that um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, based on on uh, a research interest that dates back quite a few years um, and uh, is part of a of a research adventure that, uh, in some ways, we have been uh, jointly engaging in. Um, or, yes. So let me try to put on the the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't manage to to find a way to put it uh, in full screen mode. But I hope you will be able to um, uh, see uh, the slides and decipher the data on them. Uh, nonetheless, I want to start with a little um, uh, with a brief introduction uh, on science and the moving image, and I want to argue that um, if we look at um, uh, science and film, the connection of science and the moving image, one way of addressing uh, film in this context is to speak about film as boundary object. This is a, a, a term that I borrow from. Uh, science and technology studies from one of the pioneers of science and technology studies, Susan Lee Starr. Um, and I want to uh, use this short introduction to <clears throat> uh, explore the, the utility uh, of this concept uh, for our understanding of the relationship between science and film. Let me start with an image, which is a still shot um, from an installation uh, created by Swiss video arch artist and and researcher Hannes Rickli as part of a, actually one of the longest standing um, research artistic research projects on um, uh, science and the moving image. Uh, Hannes Rickli has been working on laboratory uses of uh, film and video cameras for going on 20 years now. And what you're seeing is a still from one of his installations which he has exhibited in various places. Um, and what you're actually seeing is um, a Drosophila, uh, a fruit fly, um, in a wind channel. So if this were a moving image, you would see um, uh, the, the, the fly moving from the left uh, to the right end of the image um, uh, against a, a wind current that has been automatically generated. Um, this image is uh, excer excerpted, or the video um, is excerpted from a research design um, in which a, a geneticist and engineer um, uses the Drosophila, the fruit fly, to um, study um, the flight mechanism of the fruit fly um, in a research context which ultimately aims at developing um, uh, lift mechanisms and uh, propulsion mechanisms uh, for human and other forms of propulsion uh, based on the fruit fly. And so what the researcher does is uh, genetically modify fruit flies to create uh, varying um, disposition of the wings and then test these varying dispositions by basically throwing the genetically modified fruit flies in a wind channel. Um, this image, as we see it, and the installation, if you saw it in a large room uh, where it is usually, usually it's presented in gallery spaces, for the film and media scholar and the media archaeologist, obviously immediately uh, elicits uh, associations with um, uh, chronophotography, with the work of Etienne Jules Marais and... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> the American guy. I'm sorry. Um, it's um, I have a Edward Mybridge, obviously. Um, so you know this the, the the chain of associations is obviously also supported by the fact that this is a black and white image and um, uh, that it you know from the looks of it seems dated, um, but it, it it recalls the the movement studies of the late 19th century. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, creates a whole host of, of uh, historical associations. What's important to know is that um, Hans Rickli 
um, saved the, the video material from the trash bin. Um, he had been in contact with the researcher at the Swiss uh, Polytechnic um, who was working on this on this experiment or was uh, using this research design for his research and realized that um, uh, the research group was producing a lot of video material but uh, once they had extracted the data from that from from that video material they threw the material away um, uh, so basically what we're seeing here is a piece of trash um, a, a a moving image that has has outlived its usefulness in its original context in the original context of its production and uh, gains a second life is being repurposed if you will through um, the the dispositive of of an art project and through the dispositive of the art gallery um, one of the things that interests me here is that this is a perfect illustration of what Susan Lee Starr and James Grissomer uh, in their study uh, actually of, of uh, ethnographical collections rather than video images call boundary objects, uh, which they define as objects where, which are both plastic enough to adapt to local needs and constraints of the several parties employing them, in this case the researcher and the artist, yet robust enough to maintain a common identity across site. Um, the, the image is uh, what um, Bruno Latour, the French sociologist of science, proposed to call a immutable mobile. So uh, it's uh, it retains its basic pattern form um, regardless of the context, uh, which means it's robust enough to maintain a com common identity across sites. As boundary objects, they're weakly structured in common use to continue to quote and become strongly structured in individual site use. The, the image that you've just seen serves to extract data on, on, on fly patterns of genetically modified uh, fruit flies in the lab and it serves as an aesthetic object um, in the context of the gallery. They may be abstract or concrete. Uh, the two texts here are very different. They have different meanings and different social words, but their structure is common enough to more than one world to make them recognizable a means of translation. The creation and management of boundary objects is key in developing and maintaining coherence across intersecting social worlds. So the last point is also important. The object serves to stabilize the setup, the social configuration in which the image is used, depending uh, on the context, um, in the lab, it serves to create data, convey data, extract data uh, in the gallery uh, context. It, in a way, um, serves to uh, stabilize the art institution, stabilize a certain mode of perception, which is the aesthetic perception of the moving image as an art object. Uh, and you could also say it serves to stabilize uh, the, the reputation of the artist and uh, keep, the, keep the art system uh, going, if you will. Um, Florian Hof, uh, a media researcher whose uh, work includes, by the way, the first media history on uh, business consulting, a book which has just been translated and published by um, um, Oxford University Press with the wonderful title um, Angels of Efficiency, the Angels of Efficiency are the consultants, obviously, um, has been working on implementing the concept of boundary objects into media studies for some years now. And uh, this is a quote from one of Florian Hof's essays uh, in which uh, he proposes to, 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 to uh, modify the concept of boundary object to speak of media boundary objects, um, which... Uh, um, work in different contexts for different purposes um, and also serve to stabilize differences and non-significant boundaries in society between entities that do not usually uh, communicate. Um, there is obviously a, a long history of the interaction between science and the arts. Uh, there's a long history of the use of moving images in sciences. But one of the things that the boundary objects concept allows us to do is to differentiate very uh, uh, clearly between the, 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 the different contexts and different configurations, social configurations and systems in which these images uh, function. In the case of Hannes Rickley's uh, installation of the Drosophila, um, it allows us to very clearly um, uh, delineate the lab from the art space and it allows us to understand why the image uh, 
ends up in the dustbin in one system and ends up uh, on the wall as a potentially <clears throat> erratic art object uh, in, in the other context. So what we're looking at here <clears throat> is the science perspective and the film studies perspective. And we're looking at film as film, to quote the programmatic title of a book by Victor Perkins, one of the founding figures of film studies in Britain. And we're looking at film being used as data. Um, uh, this poses a challenge to film studies because one way of approaching um, moving images from science and in science, of course, is to maintain to a certain extent um, a, a classical film studies approach and uh, look for avant-garde aesthetics and appropriations and aesthetic appropriations uh, like the ones that Hannes Rickley performs in his work. Um, the other option is to integrate um, uh, a, a film studies approach into a science and technology studies approach and contribute um, the knowledge of film studies to um, a research perspective which is more um, axed on on questions of epistemological questions on the, of the production of scientific knowledge. Uh, I would actually quote Scott Curtis work and the work of Henning Schmidtgen, uh, a colleague at Bauhaus University in Imo, uh, some of the primary examples of the second uh, perspective. Uh, perhaps Oliver Gaken's work um, on science film and the avant-garde uh, would be a prime example of the first perspective. Um, <clears throat> I, in going forward, I want to focus on a uh, uh, a science and technology perspective, but uh, keep uh, the film studies perspective in mind as I address the example that I would like to discuss today, which is um, the Human Ethology Film Archive. Um, a uh, rather remarkable collection uh, uh, of 600 hours of uh, scientific films, which is currently stored at the Senckenberg um, Natural History Museum here in Frankfurt, um, and uh, which has an interesting history and is of particular interest uh, because of, of, for film studies because a lot of the guiding assumption of that particular archive um, uh, communicate with, not least, since uh, he was mentioned in the introduction, some of the basic ontological and epistemological assumptions about film proposed by uh, André Bazin. So what is the Human Ethology Film Archive? Let me start with the key technological uh, gadget or um, device uh, in use here. Uh, the Human Ethology Film Archive is a collection of scientific films which was put together by um, a German, Austrian uh, biologist, ethologist, uh, behavioral scientist, Irineus Eibel Eibelsfeld, and his team between 1966 and 2007. Uh, it is the result of, um, and I will just address this in a minute, it is the result of five different longitudinal studies of uh, human behavior. And the basic assumption is that uh, film uh, can be used to create a record of human behavior in what is supposedly a state of nature. And the way to do this um, is to use a camera, which Eibel Abbasfeld and... Um, as mentor Hans Haas uh, developed together, which basically uh, uh, can record uh, at an angle. As you can see here, this is a camera that will be pointed in one direction, but actually film um, uh, the scenes and, and objects that are at a 90 degree angle from where the camera is actually pointing. Um, so, Eibel uh, Eibelsfeld and Haas developed this camera in the 1960s, uh, used it in their field work, and uh, were actually quite convinced of the success of their procedure. Um, one of the things that I can tell you right away is that uh, Eibel Eibelsfeld was not a linguist. He wasn't terribly interested in what his subjects had to say. And if you listen to the sound recordings that accompany uh, the film um, uh, uh, shots uh, that he made, uh, and if you're fluent in those languages, you will understand that um, the people who filmed figured out what he was doing uh, about half an hour in, um, usually. Uh, but uh, the, the the procedure was on, uh, applied nonetheless, and the basic assumption was that this camera, which allowed you to film at an angle, would uh, be useful uh, to record human behavior. 
uh, in its state of nature. Um, Hans Haas and Irineus Eibel Eibelsfeld uh, came out of zoology and actually mar marine biology. Um, they were both uh, students of or affiliated with Konrad Lorenz, uh, one of the founders of modern uh, behavioral science, um, who was a professor uh, in, in Vienna. Um, and Hans Haas was one of the pioneers of um, uh, diving technology and uh, submarine photography. Uh, he is, if you will, the Austrian counterpart to Jacques Cousteau. And in the nineteen, in the late forties and nineteen fifties, uh, he enjoyed uh, a, a comparable fame, certainly in the German-speaking world, but also um, in Britain. Uh, some of his uh, television series were co-produced by the BBC, and in the United States, where his uh, theatrical films were uh, shown in cinemas in New York and other. Uh, major cities and reviewed by the major newspapers. Um, Eibel Eibersfeld started out as a student of Konrad Lorenz's, which means that he was primarily an ornithologist. He was stu studying the, the, the behavior of, of birds, then got interested in marine biology and joined Hans Haas uh, on his research trips in the 1950s. Um, and then in the 1960s, he became the director of the Max Planck Institute, of a new section of the Max Planck Institute uh, for Ornithology in Seabees and in Bavaria. Um, and that new department was dedicated to the study of human behavior. Basically, the assumption was to apply um, Darwinian assumptions about um, uh, the evolution of animal behavior to humans and to um, tease out and record that layer or aspect of human behavior, which was supposedly genetically determined and uh, biologically fixed rather than uh, culturally fungible. Um, the Human Ethology Film Archive uh, should be uh, considered in the context of other large-scale international research projects in the post-war era, such as the International Biological Program, a 10-year program which consisted in the compilation of large-scale data sets, um, particularly frozen tissue block samples from indigenous populations. That's a collection that is currently stored uh, in Canberra, Australia, and carries all sorts of ethical problems with it. Um, uh, it is currently the, the object of a big restitution debate. And then uh, talking about large scale organized science, the other big example, of course, is the Human Genome uh, Project in the Life Sciences, um, which was uh, conducted by uh, a very large international consortium of research between 1990 and 2003 and four, uh, which served to uh, decode uh, the entirety of the human um, uh, DNA code. Uh, another context in which <laughs> we can consider the Human Ethology Film Archive um, are artistic projects to, dedicated to the study of man as a general category. Um, uh, one famous example, of course, is the, uh, the photographic exhibition, uh, The Family of Man, which was curated by uh, American photographer and photography pioneer Edward Steichen. Um, and which was used uh, by United, United States government agencies in the post-war era or in the years between 1955 and 1962 to promote a, sort of a, a globalized uh, uh, notion of human commonality, um, uh, which uh, they hope to achieve by touring this, this exhibition in 91 cities and 38 countries in that particular um, time period. This, of course, is a, a famous exhibition of an exhibition made famous in media studies uh, by the short essay um, Roland Barthes um, dedicates to it in his uh, book Mythologie. Um, it has now been firmly established as the photo exhibition everyone loves to hate. Uh, it's been subject to uh, many, many forms of criticism in the wake of Roland Barthes, but it's still indicative of something of a certain ideology of uh, trying to create um, a, joint, a common human bond, bond um, through uh, the, the medium of photography and possibly by extension also film, uh, which was current in the post-war era. The other two um, projects I want to bring up as context here are the two major longitudinal documentary uh, initiatives. 
uh, which also um, uh, started out in the early 60s at around the same time that uh, Eibelsfeld started to build the Human Ethology Film Archive. The most famous one in the Anglo world, of course, is 7-Up or the Up series uh, initiated by Michael Apted in 1964, a sort of comparative study of the British class structure um, over uh, um, um, potentially infinite or p potentially the lifespan of the subjects. Uh, it started out uh, with portraits of a, uh, a representative group of um, uh, British children um, at age seven and then Apted uh, keep, kept on coming back every seven years. Um, Apted always likes to claim that he was the first to have that idea and start uh, the first to start a project like that, um, which is uh, not true. And uh, Apted, in fact, doesn't like to be asked questions about the competing GDR project, which is the Kinder von Goldso, uh, and which started out earlier, namely in 1961, um, uh, a longitudinal study um, of uh, a group of children, um, actually a, a first year uh, primary school uh, a group of children in a, in a village in the so-called Oderbruch, east of Berlin, um, a, a project that was actually um, part of the so-called uh, Bitterfelder program, an aesthetic, a state-ordained aesthetic uh, program in literature and the other arts, uh, which was designed to record the emergence of the socialist new man. And um, basically, uh, Winfried Junge, uh, who was the author of these documentaries and was later joined by his wife, Berbel Junge, as the co-author of these films, um, set out to produce a, a series of, of uh, short documentaries which were designed for the uh, short film program um, in, in theaters. Um, and <clears throat> Junge managed to convince, when the wall came down, managed to convince um, uh, Western television um, uh, of the value of his work and uh, managed to raise funds to continue um, the project uh, well into um, the post-wall era, um, uh, making this a, uh, a living document of Germany's reunification and transition to a supposedly democratic um, order. What's interesting here is that um, the, the interest in longitudinal studies uh, emerges at around the same time in the 1960s. There's a certain uh, idea of human commonality um, that uh, you know, is, uh, forms the groundwork for these projects, but is also being tested through these projects. And this is where there is a distinct uh, connection to the Human Ethology Film Archive. The Human Ethology Film Archive consists of five longitudinal, sorry for the spelling error, um, studies conducted between 2007. And what's interesting is not just the geographical, but also the temporal, supposedly temporal distribution. Um, these five studies are supposed to um, represent various stages um, of uh, so human development, quote unquote, according to um, uh, the then current models of uh, paleontology. Um, they're the co and uh, I'm sorry for not pronouncing the the Kung uh, Kalahari Bushman uh, from Southwest Africa, who are supposed to represent the Paleolithic Hunter Collector Society. They're the Yanomami in the Orinoco uh, Amazonas territory, uh, which are supposedly uh, representatives of an early settler society. The Apo in Papua, Western New Guinea, um, are representatives of the Neolithic Settler Society. The Himba in Namibia, again in Southwest Africa, are traditional animal husbandry. Um, or are the model for traditional animal husbandry, and the Trobriander in Polynesia are a settler and farmer um, society. What the Human Ethology Film Archive proposes to do is tease out in a longitudinal comparative study the commonalities of human behavior and thus, in a way, um, capture and seize the common uh, 
human biological essence, uh, the common biological essence that constitutes uh, humanity. What is interesting here in the research setup, of course, is uh, something that we know well from uh, cultural anthropology uh, and from, from the research designs of cultural anthropology, the, the research setups of cultural anthropology, namely the contemporaneity of the non-contemporaneous. Um, the, the observer is supposed to be historically the most advanced, uh, and while he is looking at his contemporaries in other quote-unquote cultures, uh, he's also looking back at his or her own prehistory, um, and that is precisely um, the temporal structure that we see at work in the case studies of the Human Ethology Film Archive. Um, this thought can actually be traced back to the Enlightenment, um, I'm going to bombard you with a German quote here from Friedrich Schiller's inaugural lecture on universal history, which he held in, you know, not in 1789, sorry for the spelling for the uh, error here, but in 1789, that is the year of the French universal, uh, the French revolution. Uh, and what Schiller uh, says here, he starts out by explaining his concept of universal history uh, by uh, referring to uh, the European history of exploration and uh, early colonialism, um, which he celebrates as an achievement in that it uh, provides for a lehrreiches und unterhaltendes Schauspiel, an instructive and entertaining uh, spectacle, um, in that it shows us Völkerschaften, die auf den mannigfaltigen Stufen der Bildung um uns herum gelagert sind. So we see uh, uh, peoples who represent different levels of uh, historical development. Um, and they are like Kinder verschiedenen Alters um einen Erwachsenen herum. So the observer, Friedrich Schiller, is the grown up, and the peoples he watches and he uh, is able to have knowledge of through the endeavor of European uh, expansion um, are like children uh, of different ages um, uh, illustrating his prehistory. Uh, he then goes on to, by the way, uh, discuss a, a very ambiguous emotion uh, which the spectacle inspires. Uh, he talks about the shame of having to look at how primitive um, uh, previous stages of humanity were. But if you uh, read this and uh, then go back to the research design of the Human Ethology Film Archive, you realize that not a whole lot has changed and that exactly that kind of idea of uh, universal history of mankind um, as a biological history, as an evolutionary history of uh, the essence of uh, human behavior uh, is still a play in the Human Ethology Film Archive. In terms of um, the epistemological setup of the Human Ethology Film Archive, Haas and Eibel Eibesfeld published an article early on uh, in, in the early stages of the project, which is called Film Studies in Human Ethology, from which I want to read you a few quotes. Um, the key programmatic one being this one, since the time of Darwin, we have known that the key to the understanding of human behavior lies in man's phylogenetic uh, origin. So. Um, Behavior is biologically coded, uh, it's genetically determined, it has a history, and it is part of the larger history of life. The discovery by ethologists of phylo phylogenetic adaptations in the behavior of animals open up new avenue avenues for the exploration of human behavior. Um, this is, in a way, a rehearsal of, of, of Darwin's argument in the expression of emotions in um, animals and man, where um, he claims that there is an, an historical evolutionary continuity between uh, animals and man, and um, Eibel Eibelsfeld basically latch onto the ethological, the behavioral study paradigm developed in the early 20th century by uh, Konrad Lorenz and Karl von Frisch and other uh, zoologists, and particularly ornithologists, and combine it with um, a historical view of human or, uh, you know, animal evolution uh, borrowed from Darwin. Uh, they go on to say the search for phylogenetic determinants of complicated motor patterns requires a comparative approach. Uh, so we can't just look at individual humans, we have to compare humans and humans. If we find similarities in the behavioral repertoire of people of extremely different cultural backgrounds, then we may with due caution conclude that the similar behaviors have a common genetic basis. 
So if you manage to to um, phenomenologically uh, establish uh, um, a commonality of behavioral patterns, that points to the common genetic basis. Charles Darwin was the first to use the comparative method. We are in a position to improve upon his method by using film for objective documentation. So uh, we're just doing what Dar Darwin would have done, but we have film cameras and that allows us to actually create visual evidence and filmic evidence of uh, the, the validity of the claim of um, human evolution. Film documents suitable for our purposes are present unavailable while our film libraries contain many films and cultural activities, pottery making, boat building and weaving, um, etc. Mostly staged films, mostly staged film documents on what might be called natural behavior have not been systematically collected. So this is where they radically deviate from visual anthropology, uh, which they reject and the, the, they reject the, the records of visual anthropology because it is, because they say much of it is staged and uh, filmed, uh, you know, for the purposes of documenting um, culturally specific uh, practices such as pottery making, boat building, weaving, etc. But what they're, what they're really interested in is natural behavior, that is um, the uh, that part of human behavior which is determined by biolog biological factors and not cultural factors. So they assume a very clear-cut distinction between nature and culture, um, uh, which they don't question as such, and they assume from a Darwinian perspective <clears throat> that there is a, a key basis for human be behavior which is biologically determined and can be the object of a biological study. <clears throat> this appalling lack of information is primarily due to the fact that natural behavior changes under the eye of the camera. People often fear the camera or are irritated by having a camera directed at them. Their awareness that they are being photographed may make them rigid or restless, they may giggle, smile, or overplay their roles. And this is why they develop their funny little camera, which films at an angle, uh, in the hope of uh, catching people unawares. Um, let me show you a little example. It's in German, but um, it serves to illustrate what they're up to. Uh, you don't have to understand the commentary to see what they're trying to do. Uh, I will still try and translate um, some of the main comments. This is uh, a, a film called, this is, uh, is part of the, the film is part of the um, Encyclopedia Kinematografica, um, an, an encyclopedia, massive collection of uh, scientific research and um, uh, uh, teaching films, which was located in Göttingen in, in Germany and had a system, of, a global system of correspondence. Uh, Eibel Eibelsfeld was one of the founders of that collection and he contributed many films to it. And the one that you're going to see is one of the most famous ones. And it's also famous because it served to legitimize the research design uh, of the Human Ethology Film Archive because what they're describing um, uh, the lifting of eyebrows as a communicative gesture, uh, which they can observe across cultural contexts, um, is actually the primary piece of evidence that they used to, to legitimize their entire research project. So, you know, if you, if you do research for 40 years on, on, on one topic, the money has to come from where from somewhere. Uh, it came out of the budget of the Max Planck Gesellschaft and um, the Augengruß, the discovery of the Augengruß was one of the key triggers that convinced funders that they were onto something that they, they should continue. Das kurze Heben der Augenbrauen drückt bei uns Menschen soziale Kontaktbereitschaft aus. Mütter und andere Personen zeigen diesen Augengruß, wenn sie sich Kindern zuwenden. Hier sieht man eine schwedische Großmutter mit ihrem Enkel. Auch Erwachsene begrüßen sich untereinander so. Hier eine Französin. Hier eine Deutsche. Ein Balinese. Eine Balinesin, 
ein Zeilonese. Eine junge Frau von der Südseeinsel Rangiroa. Der gleiche, sehr formkonstante Bewegungsablauf bei einem Mann von Rangiroa, bei einer Samoanerin, bei einem Mann von Moria, einer Zpuli von den Philippinen und einem Aktamann, ebenfalls von den Philippinen. So I think you get the point. Uh, wherever you turn your camera, you will find people who lift their eyebrows to engage in uh, communication. Um, and clearly this is something uh, not culturally coded, but uh, a, a universal pattern of human behavior. Um, and the whole enterprise rested on the assumption that there are multiple um, uh, cases uh, and there's a whole repertory of behavioral patterns that are functions just like this. In terms of the methodology, um, what the, the Human Ethology Film Archive is based on is uh, the sequence of observation, documentation and comparison. So basically um, what they do is go out in the field uh, and uh, record uh, what they assume to be patterns of human behavior. Um, they create a written record. Um, there is always a soundtrack to accompany the, the, the film recordings. Um, and then they take the material back to their research station, to the Max Planck Institute, and start comparing recordings in order to tease out the, um, the, the, the continuous uh, patterns, patterns that appear in all the various recordings from the various uh, field studies of uh, quote unquote cultures. Um, the model for this uh, again is ornithology. Um, this is a classical um, uh, case of uh, a behavioral pattern uh, in geese, uh, the Einrollung Bewegung der Graugrans, as observed by Konrad Lorenz and Nico Tinbergen in 1938. Um, and uh, what you see here is a, uh, a design, or it's actually a, a, a drawing um, based on um, a, a film sequence. Um, the uh, Scott Curtis has done important work on the on the relationship between scientific drawing and film and has in his work on uh, developmental psychologist Arnold Gazelle shown how um, drawings um, made from films serve to highlight the the key elements of behavioral patterns both uh, in terms of creating uh, evidence um, in research and in creating evidence for uh, teaching. Um, and the term ethogram uh, here refers to a um, uh, conclusive um, um, uh, behavioral pattern. Um, this is an ethogram is a representation of, a beha of the key moments in a behavioral rep uh, pattern that can be endlessly repeated and that will appear in all representatives, in all individuals of a given species. So the Einrollbewegung der Graugans, the grey geese is um, uh, rolling in of an egg that has fallen out of the nest, can be observed in, in, in exactly the same way in all cases where you have uh, grey de geese dealing with this uh, particular problem. So what you see here is an ethogram, uh, a, a visual representation of a behavioral pattern. Um, notational um, challenges are a key element of the human ethology film archive. What you can see uh, here on the left is a page from one of uh, Eibel Eibelsfeld's books, uh, which repeats the argument of the Augengruß, of the eye greeting. That's an easy one because you could basically have uh, parallel montages. It becomes more complicated with more complex uh, bodily behavior patterns, such as dance. And uh, there is actually a connection to the history of the European avant-garde here in that Eibel Eibelsfeld adapted the so-called labanotation lab or kinetography um, developed by um, a German choreographer, avant-garde uh, dance choreographer, uh, Rudolf Laban, for scientific research and uh, used uh, labanotation to transcribe uh, um, bodily behavior from film uh, 
and create the kinds of uh, visual patterns uh, that you can see here. Um, <clears throat> what is important to note is that in terms of the cinematic record, um, montage is absolutely forbidden. Um, to quote or to, to use a term introduced by uh, André Bazin, there is a principle of montage interdit. Um, uh, the, the cinematic record is supposed to contain the whole behavioral sequence in its integrity. Um, you're not allowed to cut. And actually, in Conrad Lawrence's lab, uh, you were not allowed to uh, freeze frame the film or even, uh, it, it, you know, it was even critical to use slow motion. But you can, of course, use slow motion and time lapse for reasons of evidence and comparison, uh, which is what I was failed certainly did in the human ethology film archive. Um, what is important to note here, and this is the other Bazinian aspect, um, which is connected to the strong belief that uh, there should be no editing, um, is that um, for Eibel Eibelsfeld and his team, once they got back to their research center in Seewiesen and looked at the films, the films themselves were the object of study. Um, so they believed that the, 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 um, uh, that the film was not just the purveyor of data, but that the filmic sequence was the object itself. So there was a, a, a strong assumption of an ontological connection between uh, the object, uh, the filmed object, the behavioral sequence, and the filmic record, um, the filmed image, uh, which sustained the whole epistemology of the project. Now, um, to uh, branch out uh, or to, to further interpret um, this uh, epistemology and to give a brief rundown of what I think uh, some of the key assumptions of this project are, um, I mean, it's always a good time to use one of the most famous quotes in the uh, recent history of theory, but it is particularly opposite here, the ending of Michel Foucault's Les Mots et les Choses from 1966. Uh, in which he points out the historicity of the object um, that we call man, the object of study and the object of knowledge that we call man. You all know the famous uh, quote uh, about the face drawn in the sand at the edge of the sea, which can be easily uh, erased uh, by the further development um, of uh, human knowledge and uh, by the emergence of new paradigms uh, of knowledge. This was, of course, a scandalous uh, claim. Um, in uh, 1966 when it was first published because it was directed at um, uh, certain notions, uh, certain, uh, from Foucault's point of view, lazy notions of humanism, um, uh, and uh, they served to historicize uh, man as an uh, epistemological object um, according to uh, a paradigm which Foucault obviously had inherited from his teacher, Georges Canguilhem, which is a, a, the paradigm of historical epistemology. What interests, interests me here is the year of publication, which happens to be the same year as uh, the start date of the Human Ethology Film Archive. Um, one of the things that we can say is, uh, if we look at the methodology of the Human Ethology Film Archive and ask ourselves what the object of study really is, namely, human nature as defined in biological terms, we realize that the Human Ethology Film Archive is a large-scale operation in the construction of human nature as an effect of montage, or actually as an effect of entre image, to quote uh, Raymond Belour's term, um, which he developed in his analysis of film installations. Um, <coughs> we could argue that um, human nature here and I'm borrowing the term from uh, Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveros Castro. Uh, human nature here is uh, thematized and proposed as a differential relation, uh, actually as a relation between images. Um, uh, Viveros de Castro, who uh, is strongly influenced uh, by Gilles Deleuze and uh, was anointed as one of his two successors uh, by Claude Lévi-Strauss in the um, 1980s. 
uh, proposes this particular formula, it is not the relations that vary, but the variations that are related. Uh, there's a whole um, ontological concept involved in this, in which human nature is no longer a common denominator, no longer a self-same substance located within some naturally privileged place, uh, but in which human nature uh, should be understood as a differential relation. Um, so human nature could be understood as the differential relation between terms, between the terms that it naturalizes. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, this project, which set out in 1966 to find the biological substance uh, that unifies uh, humanity as a biological species, um, actually uh, shares some of the properties with um, post-structuralist and deconstructivist approaches to ontological notions of human nature as a self-same same substance. Because if you look at what really is in the human ethology film archive, and if you look at how they conceptualize uh, uh, human nature, you could say that they're sort of ahead of themselves in the sense that uh, they're really looking at sequences of images and that they're looking at human nature as a differential relation between images. Um, and as something that is located in the entre image rather than as a substance, as a genetic substance. They, of course, assume that the um, biological substance of humanity is the human genome, uh, but they're not geneticists and they're not doing that work. That work was done later on in the 1990s and the Human Genome Project, but the work that they're actually doing is one in which human nature is sort of deferred as a substance in a differential relation between um, the terms that it naturalizes. So um, in conclusion, what I'm trying to say is that the human ethology film archive can be seen as a boundary object in two ways. Um, it is a boundary object for people like us, film scholars who approach it from a film studies point of view and ask ourselves, you know, there's there's this archive of 600 uh, hours of film, which is a rare occurrence. Uh, what are we going to do with this from a film studies point of view? Um, uh, it's a boundary object for a variety of other disciplines. Um, the Senckenberg uh, History of Natural, uh, Senckenberg Museum of Natural History has held several conferences bringing in linguists, uh, cultural anthropologists, biologists, film scholars to look at the material and try to figure out what to do with it now, um, now that it is largely a historical object. And so that's a classical boundary object situation. You have something that had a, a, a visual material that had an original um, meaning and use in its context of production. Uh, that context of production no longer exists. The, the, the Department of Human Ethology at the Max Planck Institute in Seewiesen has long been disbanded. Um, the, the, the recording uh, sequence, the, the longitudinal studies stopped uh, 13 years ago. Um, and now you have a, a whole set of specialists from other disciplines looking at this material, trying to figure out what it means or what it means to them. Uh, so that's a, an experiment in creating boundary objects. But you could also say that internally, the films in the human ethology film archives are bi boundary objects in that they con uh, communicate two orders of knowledge um, that are not really communicating, um, namely um, the Darwinian um, uh, geneticist um, uh, perspective on evolution that is what um, uh, served as the basis for the whole project and the uh, relational conception of human nature as an entre image, which they ended up producing. Um, in conclusion, I just want to um, point you to, I'm, I'm using this as, a, as an advertising platform, to a publication we put together over the last few months and which will be released as an open access publication on October 27. Um, it's a project called Pandemic Media, um, which appears in our series Configurations of Film. Uh, it's 37 short essays on what the pandemic means for us as media scholars, and it includes, among other things, this essay, Mediating Disease, Scientific Transcriptions of COVID-19 into Animal Models. 
by Benjamin Schulz Figueroa and Sofia Greve. Sofia Greve, who is a, a, a scholar um, who has been working on behavioral sciences in film um, for many years and is uh, in the course of completing her dissertation at the University of Marburg, which is just up the river from where I am. And um, they're addressing the question of um, animal models, model organisms in uh, contemporary virological research and touch upon many of the same issues that I've tried to address in this talk. And then also another uh, brief uh, preview of coming attractions. Uh, there's an essay in there on the visualizations of viruses, a comparison between uh, COVID-19 and HIV uh, by Bishnu Priyagosh. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much.